Steve. And now for our final conversation this morning, we'll discuss antibiotic resistance and its impact on all of us, how our overuse and misuse of antibiotics creates resistance, and why there aren't many new antibiotics coming down the pipeline. In short, what does antibiotic resistance mean for human health? We're delighted to be joined by several people who are on the front lines of these issues. <laughs> Kathy Talkington is the director of the Antibiotics Resistance Project at Pew Charitable Trusts. Barry Eisenstein is a distinguished physician at Merck and Company. And Wanda Feiler is president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. And finally, Georges Benjamin is direct, executive director, rather, of the American Public Health Association. And so once again, Steve Clemens will lead our conversation. God, I was really going to try and change my tie so that you thought I would be a different person. Greetings, everybody. Um, so. Here we're into the issue of, of treating with antibiotics, and uh, just a short bit ago I mentioned, I don't know if Barry heard, I, I did a call out to Merck and uh, what you're doing, and you know, I am interested in this, in this question of why your industry seems not to have invested much in diversifying antibiotic options, and I, I just kind of get, you know, sort of a no-nonsense response from you on, on why Merck is doing what it's doing and why so many other big pharmaceutical players haven't, haven't done more than they, than they are doing. Thank you. Um, is the phone on? Uh, Merck, I guess it is. <laughs> Merck has a long tradition of involvement in antimicrobials, having been involved with the first uh, sulfas back in the 1930s and the tradition uh, continued and, and actually were the major developers of the first uh, carbapenem, which, which as practicing physicians we know is probably the, the, the best, last, really good class of antimicrobials. Colistin was mentioned earlier, but as you may know, colistin is a really last-ditch drug because it has such problems with nephrotoxicity. In fact, as a practicing physician, we often, not often, but sometimes have confronted with the issue, is it the life or the kidneys? And, and you have to make that sort of choice. The carbapenems, though, are really good antimicrobials. They're very potent. <clears throat> and we're starting to see resistance develop to those as well. So this is, this is the problem. Merck has also a major tradition in terms of uh, vaccination. And I can't stress strongly enough <clears throat> the importance of thinking about vaccinations, immunizations, as part of the overall stewardship process. If we can prevent the infection by using agents that do not select for resistance, do not affect the microbiome, isn't this, in fact, the best way to approach the, the, growing, the growing issue? Now, why does Merck continue in, in, in this? I, I think there, there are elements of, of Merck that, um, that quite frankly, um, in a way, go against what might be considered normal business uh, practices. Uh, Merck uh, has invested. You just sent the stock falling. <clears throat> well, uh, no, yeah, but, no, but to, to, to give you two quick examples, uh, there's a Merck for Mothers program that was begun about ten, about five years ago. It's a ten-year effort. A half a billion dollars was set aside, purely eleemosynary uh, investment that does not come back in terms of return on investment, and it's meant as a global approach to try to get mater <clears throat> maternal mortality rates down. The second, e equally striking, is the fact that Merck has invested uh, literally billions of dollars into the discovery and development and manufacture of ivermectin, a drug that has absolutely no commercial value in the developed world. Hmm. It's used for river blindness. And in fact, William Campbell just was awarded the Nobel Prize for the original discovery of that while working at Merck. And it was, it was I guess, folks like me, I, I like to think that I could stand up uh, and, and be as good as this. But a number of years ago, folks like me at Merck said, we must continue to develop this drug, even though we're not going to reap a profit because there are literally millions of individuals in third world countries, particularly in Africa, that are going blind because of onchocerciasis, river blindness. And ivermectin actually will work to prevent that. So as, as an employee of Merck, I have to tell you, 
I walk into the um, corporate headquarters in, in Kenilworth, and there's an enormous uh, statue in, in, in the entrance hall of a blind man being helped by his five-year-old child and uh, with a stick walking through uh, uh, from Africa. And basically it says, this is no longer going to be a problem with ivermectin. It's very inspiring. And, and as, our, as our CEO, Ken Frazier, has said to us, uh, when you feel inspired like this, you, you, you put in additional action. You, you, mm-hmm. you put in additional effort. You want to continue to work that way. Now, that said, it's, from a purely business standpoint, completely understandable why the pharmaceutical industry has gotten out of the antimicrobial uh, business. Antibiotics are acute drugs. They're used for short periods of time. You can't gain lifelong use as you can for drugs for Alzheimer's or depression, uh, cholesterol elevation. Not that Merck isn't working on those as well. Of course, they have to because they must maintain some profitability. Uh, We can't be foolish about that. The trouble, though, with antimicrobials is that in part because of the, the shortened use, in part because when you do develop a new antimicrobial, the first thing that happens, not inappropriately, is it gets put on the shelf behind a glass wall with a little sign that says, break glass in emergency only. Mm. This is known as putting the drug on the shelf. And as a practicing or used to be practicing ID physician, I get it. I understand that. But think about what that does in terms of return on investment in trying to go into the antimicrobial space. So the economists refer to this as net present value, the value of a drug based on the fact that a dollar today is worth way more than that dollar will be five, 10 years from now. So the net present value of an antimicrobial is just barely positive when you have net present values of drugs for musculoskeletal disease, CNS disease, oncology that are way up here. So this is a really <laughs> profound statement. I mean, I, I, I want to move through the panel here, yeah. but, but I think that as we're discussing, particularly in the, in the uh, animal husbandry, are all these sorts of practices we need, the innovation side that could basically take us off, you know, small, narrow set of antibiotics, that innovation side is stuck in a game theory problem. Of, of the incentives not being aligned right. And that's a, you know, from a public policy area, that's a fascinating it, challenge. It certainly is. And if I could just interject one more uh, thought, I think an important one. Uh, imagine a world where we had rapid diagnostics that would enable one, number one, to determine if you had a bacterial or viral infection. So when you're a little child, and I'm going to turn to the practitioner's uh, family right. practice in mm-hmm. particular in a moment, I think would be very Wanda, appropriate. Yeah. Five-year-old child with fever, upper respiratory tract infection, is there an antibiotic that's required or not? Wouldn't it be nice to have a diagnostic that can tell you essentially instantly you don't need the antibiotic? You have to remember at the present time that worldwide, the leading cause of death in children that age is pneumonia. So you can't withhold the antimicrobial if you think that's a possibility. But think of the enormous overuse that you're then engendering. So a diagnostic that could tell you that if you knew you had a bacterial infection, what's the bacterium, and importantly, what is the susceptibility? And you can therefore know at the very earliest stages. Now, even if the first empiric drug, because the patient's in sepsis and may be dying, is very broad spectrum, wouldn't it be nice by the second dose that you can markedly narrow down Mm -hmm. the spectrum and use the right drugs? The trouble is these diagnostics have the same issue that antimicrobials do in terms of return on investment. And I was at the Washington, uh, the the, uh, White House panel back in June on antimicrobial stewardship. I was sitting next to the CEO of a major diagnostic company. He told me, Barry, um, there's no value for us in terms of develop. We have the technology available, but it's it's very difficult for us to see a return on, on investment. Imagine if that could be incented. The wine could start this. And you can couple that then with a more narrow spectrum right. antibiotic and demonstrate the value to society and reap the appropriate rewards that then incent additional innovation. That would be sensational. Any members of Congress? <laughs> <laughs> Just down the street. Before I jump to Wanda, Kathy, I mean, I was reading uh, some piece you wrote for Pew 
on fighting superbugs in 2016. And it, you know, basically had a really sort of stark frame for this, that any use of antibiotics basically screws us. And did, did I get that wrong? And, 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 I, and I'm sort of, you know, that, that you said it's a, sort of a necessary evil. But, I mean, you, you've had some very stark warnings about superbugs, what's okay. coming down the pike, and, and you become fervent supporters of the president's um, cuts and use plan, if, if, if that's what I can call it. But take us down that road for a moment, sure. and then I want to come to the family physicians. Sure. So I think that we started out by saying that antibiotics, whenever you use antibiotics, it's going to lead to resistance. There's a direct correlation. Right. It's inevitable. And I think that's been mentioned before. Um, so, so I think there are a number of fronts that we need to be focused on. Uh, as I mentioned in that piece, the, the president's plan has been an important initiative in getting attention to this, this issue. There's been some momentum within the administration within this past year. We've seen some good appropriations. Um, especially on the human side, uh, for new activity. So I think all of that is, is good news. Um, I think uh, in terms of the development piece, and I, should, I guess I should say that Pew's um, project on antibiotic resistance uh, is involved in all three areas. We're involved in the human stewardship, animal stewardship, and the drug development piece. So we're looking at policy and research opportunities. Where do you get the biggest bang for your effort across those Platforms. Well, I think they're all important. Um, because of the complexity of this issue, as we've heard a little bit already this morning, um, we know that antibiotic use in one setting has impact in all settings. Um, so I think all of these areas are critical. Um, I was going to say, in terms of the drug development piece, um, the economic con uh, incentives are critical. I think it's also important to look at the regulatory pathways for uh, drug development, and there's some legislation in front of Congress right now, uh, trying to look at limited uh, d development of drugs for limited populations that have very few options. I think that's an important focus. And then finally, the scientific discovery and development of drugs is also an another focus area that I think that needs some attention. And as one of the things that Pew is working on, we pulled together some experts within the field um, to, to identify what are the key scientific challenges to developing new drugs. Um, when you look at the pipeline of antibiotics, there are not enough in the pipeline, and there are not enough that are targeting those really hard to treat resistant diseases. But there's diseases. a science innovation piece, and then there's the financial incentive to move it forward, right? right. So even if important. you get the science piece of it right, how do you exactly. solve Barry's problem yeah. on the return on, on investment. No, and I think that my point is they're all, we have to look at all of those areas. We can't just Maybe focus on one. Maybe should become a biotech company. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a plan that uh -huh. we're uh, putting together that should be released in the next uh, month or so that's outlining those scientific priorities and then some uh, strategies for moving that part of it forward. There has been some movement on the financial side. Uh, a few years ago, legislation passed to extend the uh, period of time when an antibiotic is not facing competition from generics, but that's not the, the only answer. That's a, a start in the right direction. Now, Wanda, you're a family physician, yes. I understand, for, for 25 years, and you have a worry about the over-prescribing of antibiotics. And I'm interested in the sort of interface there <laughs> and what we're talking about. You know, I, you know, I, I tend to, to dislike doctors, not, not personally, but <laughs> just I feel You're not like alone. I, I don't want to go that way. <laughs> but occasionally I get sinus infections from all the travel I do. And so I have a relationship with my doctor where he doesn't like me very much. I don't like him very much. And we try and so I get a, you know, over the phone prescription because he knows I know what and I go get my Z pack and, and it's been a comfortable relationship for years. So <laughs> tell me why that's bad. Well, first of all, I hate to tell you, but most likely your sinus infection is viral. Uh, um, as is a bronchitis. So nothing I'm taking is helping. It's just, um, it's just, yeah. Typically, what if it, what we do is is clinically we look at a patient. So I'm a, I'm an example of, of, of what's problem. wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I hate to tell you. <laughs> just wanted to confess. But we all knew that. So that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Typically, when we see patients in the office, we actually run a, a, a program through our 
uh, organization called Choosing Wisely. Right. And many m medical associations around the country have recommended this Choosing Wisely campaign. And sometimes it's not so much about what we do as cho as choosing what we shouldn't be doing. I see. And we know that about 40... So what does that mean? That means that about 40% of U.S. healthcare is probably unnecessary, duplicative care. And when it comes to antibiotics, you do know you can do some harm. And so it, part of my role is to have you actually come into the office. Most of us won't give antibiotics over the phone anymore, even when you have got that insistent patient. Um, we have them come in because a clinical you exam. You have no idea how insistent I am. You have no idea how stubborn we can be. <laughs> um, have you come in and really and, and, and assess if you've had, you know, a head cold and you've got sinus pressure and you've had this for seven days, we're going to say no in mm -hmm. all probability. This is typically viral. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on a lot of airplanes myself. I've had that sinusitis. Mm -hmm. But reaching for the antibiotic is not usually the um, going to help you. And yes, you'll get better in about a week, about the time you'd finish that z pack. Guess what? You probably would have gotten better even without that an that antibiotic. And the problem is that that public demand, which I will tell you in my 25 years, mm. the public demand for antibiotics has dropped. I do not see nearly the push really? for antibiotics that I used to see. I think the public is getting the message. Mm. And they'll come in. If a patient comes in and they said, oh, I've got this bad cold for about three days and everybody at work has it, well, you know what? This is a viral illness. Everybody at work has it. Let's keep an eye on this. If things do not get better or you seem like you are getting better and then you get sick again, what we call double sickening, that may be a clue that maybe it's time to change my thought process. Maybe you start to run a fever. There are, however, in family medicine, a lot of the patients we see today are highly complex. And the complexity in, in primary care is huge. Most of my patients have five to ten diagnoses. And so when they come in with a head cold or urinary tract infection, and that's all it is, you think, thank God I can catch up on my schedule. Um, because typically people have many other conditions. So they'll come in and they'll come in and they're on dialysis and, and you know, a type 2 diabetic and all of the various diagnoses. And we're taking care of that whole person. My risk-benefit analysis is going to be determined a lot on some of these other conditions, mm -hmm. these comorbid conditions. So that patient who's got a temp of 99.7 that's sitting over here who's got all these other things might be at greater risk. And maybe this is a person, clinically I'm going to say, this would be the time that maybe I am going to give you an antibiotic. Um, but that story, you have to look at that whole picture, not simply I got off an airplane and I've got bronchitis or, I'm, you know, we're even... Um, um, trying to help educate parents nowadays, there are many ear infections that we don't typically necessarily jump to an antibiotic anymore. If it's a parent that I know, the child's pretty comfortable, they're not running a high fever, they can get in touch with me, as, you know, for, or if we're not going into a holiday weekend, I might stay in touch with that parent and say, you call me if things get worse, or maybe I'll give you the antibiotic and say, don't fit the prescription and say, don't fill this for a day or two unless you think things are really not getting any better. Maybe we, and that actually, that strategy, it seems to be panning right. out. People are kind of holding on to it. It gives them a comfort level, but that child never gets the Let antibiotic. Let me ask you, the president's action plan on this um, sets targets for reducing <laughs> antibiotic use, 50% right. reduction in outpatient use, 20% reduction for inpatient use by, by 2020. Does anybody in your industry aware of what he's doing, what he's asked for? We've been sending it out, yes. I would and, say and they are. I don't so know. So how would you grade your industry for well, response? Well, it's early. We're still in gestation. So, uh, um, so right now I'd probably say a C, but I will tell you that this is not new. Hmm. That 50% <clears throat> target is new, but we've been reducing antibiotic, um, I think, the demand, public demand and also having that conversation with a patient to say, you know, this isn't appropriate for you today. Just before I jump to George's, but Kathy and, and, and Barry, would, how would you grade uh, the health industries um, moving towards those targets? And do you think it's doable? Well, I think um, I think there has been some progress, and I think there's an opportunity for a lot more progress. And part of the problem is we don't have the information and the tools and the policies in place yet to make that movement happen. I'm happy to talk more about that, but I think there are opportunities now uh, to get better information and, and, and put some policy levers to continue that progress. And those right. diagnostic tests that mm -hmm. he mentioned are not readily available. I can't do a, you know, except maybe for flu, which is in some offices, I can't quickly do a test on you and say viral bacterial. So what it is, it comes down to clinical acumen. So we're probably not going to meet these targets. 
Oh, I'm an optimist. In three and a half years, well, you're just saying we don't have the tools, we don't well, have the data, I think we don't we, have the means and methods. We have the incentive. But I and, think we're we're getting closer. Yeah, um, yeah. I think we're there are opportunities. Um, for example, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services is about to release their what they call their conditions of participation, where right. they're requiring stewardship programs within in, inpatient facilities. And so I think that's an opportunity. Once that's in place, then facilities will have stewardship programs. In the outpatient settings, which is a little bit different and there are different policy opportunities, we have good information about what's happening in, because of prescriptions. So we can tell why people are giving antibiotics for what conditions. And we know there's a huge opportunity for improvement there. Mm -hmm. And so Pew has been working with CDC, for example, to set what those targets should be for these different conditions. Right. And so I think there's a lot of new activity that's happening that really will get us there with the We've just aligned commitment. new quality metrics with Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, America's health insurance plans, and those 18 or so new quality metrics, mm -hmm. one of them is what we don't do around antibiotics and, and those presumably viral infections. Mm -hmm. And so physicians are, you know, are complaining mightily about checking boxes. What we're trying to do is consolidate them across the insurance industry and so that all payers are going to be looking at the same items, mm -hmm. and we're going to get more relevant data, but a big part of that is the metric quick, about ben, antibiotics. Yeah, just, just real quick, that we need really good negative predictive value for any of these diagnostic tests, as well as clinical acumen. What I mean by that is you better be sure the patient doesn't have a bad bacterial infection. Amen. Case in point, as an intern many years ago, I saw a patient at the University of North Carolina, co-ed, came in. She was told that she had a viral infection, the flu, go back to bed. Four hours later, brought to the emergency room, she was comatose with meningococcal bacteremia. She ended up dying. You only need to see one of those folks to know how serious it is and how important it is to start therapy right away if the patient is septic. Because mm -hmm. every 15 minutes you wait, the mortality goes up measurably. So this is the this is the conundrum. Yep. So George has, has been a friend of mine for a long time with the American Public Health Association. He has a great book out of of um, political cartoons, really, of healthcare ridiculousness, uh, uh, <laughs> if I may. And uh, but we've talked a lot, and I know that you've been you know very very concerned about growing antibiotic resistance. So my first first question is, are there any good cartoons of this that we can distribute to everyone <laughs> that haven't made it into the book like uh, that you've seen? And and uh, uh, it's a really great book. I look at it when I'm you know down and out. I look at it, you know, you, you see, it's a, it's a wonderful little collection of, of yeah. cartoons. Um, so is there anything on that? And then, and then secondly, you've heard a lot this morning, both on animal husbandry and uh, the farm and farm to table. And here we're talking about other dimensions of antibiotic use. Where do you think we would get the biggest effort in return, given uh, the scale of the challenges, which I know you, you take very seriously? Yeah, I think we have to think about this from a collaborative perspective. But, you know, we, we clearly have to focus certainly on the, on, on the um, animal side of this. Right. No question about that. But we also have to pay a lot of attention to the clinical side. You know, we have over 260 million antibiotic courses prescribed each year in the outpatient setting. Mm. And the president says they want to get that down to half. 130 million. Yeah, that's, that's a... <laughs> yeah. That's you're, a, you're not real optimistic yeah, about that. that. that that's yeah. a lot of antibiotic uh, behavior change. Um, and so I think the real issue here is both trying to get... So George is tweetable. George Spencer thinks President Obama's... <laughs> and it's unrealistic. That can be tweeted. Okay. The, the, um, uh, we've got to deal with the demand side of it. Mm. So the patient's coming in and saying, you know, I must have this antibiotic. I get it every single time. Yeah, you. you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and then the, um, the prescriber side of it. It's going to require a great deal of education. Um, the health literacy involved in getting people to understand um, what is a virus, because people still... You know, we went through the Ebola outbreak um, frequently with people talking about this virus called Ebola. So trying to get people to understand the difference between a virus and a bacterium and an antibiotic, you know, which we have lots of therapies, an antiviral agent for which we have not as many, um, is, is a big So you've been at this challenge. a long time. Have you ever had any success at all with health literacy in any, any area? Has, yeah. has there any example of where we got it right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, it, it requires um, good communication, thinking about it, dedication. Um, you know, the, the public health community has actually been pretty good at changing community norms. 
Mm-hmm. Um, tobacco is the best example of where we've totally changed the normative behavior uh, in not, the country. Not in, I was in Las Vegas last week. Not in Las Vegas. It's, well, uh, not, not in Las not Vegas, yet, yet. but I'm in the United States. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. So. Uh, the, um, the ser- but no, yeah, we've changed behavior there and uh, in that area, and we can do the same thing here. Uh, we can change both practitioner behavior on the physician side. We can change um, patient demand for antibiotics. Um, and we, but we do need to get better at, um, I think Barry's absolutely right, um, knowing when something's bacteria and when it's a virus is a big deal. You know, you know as you know, I practiced emergency medicine for a long right. time. At 3 o'clock in the morning, when a mom comes in and the kid's got a temperature of 103 and they look real sick. Um, now, once you get them hydrated and get the temperature down, and now they're running around the emergency department not looking very ill, um, and they've got a, a, a bright red um, eardrum, and then you've got to decide, is this bacterial or is this viral? Um, and, you know, the decision at 3 o'clock in the morning, when the, pa- the parent's been there, um, they're looking for something different, um, you're, you're telling them, well, just a little fluids, a little, a little Tylenol, um, just watch them, it's okay. Um, you know, it, it's a difficult conversation if they don't come with the fundamental understanding of that they may not need an antibody because that is why they came to see you. Um, and that's the challenge. You would agree, right? That's Amen. the challenge you have. Uh, and then I got to tell you, um, I've been there. Well, um, it, sounds, the ER. it sounds similar to what we heard from some of the farming groups is that building in a skepticism of use or a tailored use um, sounds like what everyone thinks is the right way to go, but there is this side that says, "Well, why not?" Because it, 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 you know, the 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 cost in this in this particular small case, just to be safe, just to just to get you know the 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 pigs in 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 condition over their you know short life pan or something, sounds similar to the patient that you have. That why not why not do that? So isn't it hard to get that tilt towards the skeptical? I, I, what I see yeah. is that the public in general knows that antibiotics are, for the most part, not something that we need as much of anymore until it's them. Hmm. Until they're the ones that are miserable. I'm not pointing. Yeah, I am pointing to you. Yeah, until, no, I, I completely endorse that. Until it's until it's them, and yeah. then they're they're uncomfortable. They feel miserable, and and more so when it's their child, hmm. and their child, and it's and it's understandable fear. You know, that's where. For me as a family physician, that relationship is so critical. Hmm. I have an opportunity to take care of these people over time. They know me. I may give them my cell phone number and say, you call me if anything goes awry or you have a question. That's what we're here for. That's what we do. Um, and that, that typically hmm. works well. But when you've got the person that, you know, that comes in and their, their expectation is, I'm going to get an antibiotic today, that can be a difficult conversation. Sometimes it's, you know, what I will say to them is you're not alone. If we don't do this today, you're not alone. But there are other strategies we can deploy. George, your, your big comment, though, is that on the demand side, on the, on the patient side, there has to be a because we really haven't talked about literacy at that level. But you see that as a as a fundamental component. Well, I think that's, that's yeah. a big issue. And, and um, m- making sure that patient, you know, parents understand it so that when they if they do have to come back, um, and then get an antibiotic, or if they come back because the, the, the patient's gotten very sick, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's, there's an understanding that, you, you know, um, there, there's a shared responsibility for that decision. Right. Just to Kathy, pick up yeah. on, the, on, the, on the literacy, some of the same folks who demand to have the antimicrobial are the ones that refuse to have their children vaccinated because mm-hmm. they're afraid of the misguided notion there's autism associated with that. So we have to... We have a lot of work to do on the literacy side. Kathy, have you at, at Pew have you done research or work on the on the demand side of this? Not specifically. <clears throat> the, the point I was going to make, though, I think another communication uh, channel for having these conversations is the potential adverse events or effects of taking um, antibiotics. I think that's not mentioned enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it's not harmless to give a drug when it's not needed. So if that, you know, we have that equation about whether or not this is a necessary drug, that the, the impact of the adverse effect needs to be part of that equation. Dr. Bell mentioned it earlier this morning that... Um, Clostridium difficile is a 
diarrheal disease that can lead to death. I think. So every time I use a Z pack, I'm yeah. sending humanity over a cliff, <laughs> right? That's <laughs> what you want me to think. <laughs> Let, let's go to the audience uh, for questions. Do you, I want to give Yale. Do you, do you have any comments, questions, Yale? Since you came all the way from Houston, you're, you look fine. I'm Great boots. Here, let me uh, uh, here. Let me bring you the microphone. You can say that louder. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank the the pork board for putting this on and I'm learning a lot. I appreciate the speakers being here. That's I'm all I have. I'm giving Yale special treatment as he and I walked in this morning at 6.30 this morning. He was mm. the first guy I saw. He was way, way early. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, other comments, questions? Well, yes, right here, this gentleman. Uh, Chuck Husack, uh, August Lang and Husack, a marketing firm, healthcare marketing firm in Bethesda. Great. Can resistance be reversed? Hmm. Once a bug becomes resistant to an antibiotic, is that the end of the story? Yeah, just briefly, uh, early in my career in microbiology, I demonstrated that some very rare <coughs> resistance uh, mutations would actually cause the organism to become less fit, and they grew hmm. sl more slowly. And then there was natural reversion when you take the antibiotic pressure off. Unfortunately, most resistance that's caused by these plasmids, you heard about them earlier, these transmissible extra uh, genes, don't have in, any, any measurable fitness cost. So it, they typically do not revert. That's the problem. Fascinating. Good question. Yes. Or the bacteria forward evolved to become fit again. Yes. And it locks in the resistance yes. mutation, and that's why cycling of antibiotics with different classes in hospitals hasn't worked to revert right. to the susceptible So it's not phenotype. like you're really in this business. Is there anything promising that you've developed or are developing or thinking about that answers some of these concerns? Yeah, so I don't want to advertise for any of our stuff. I'm asking you But to we advertise. have two highly specific antimicrobial monoclonal antibodies that are in phase two clinical testing, hmm. both of which have fast-track status at the FDA and are dependent on the use of a rapid diagnostic. Hmm. So uh, I do have a question about diagnosis, yeah. Yeah. though. Do you diagnose people for influenza to see if they have influenza versus a bacterial infection? And because we do have anti-influenza drugs that can be used. Wanda? Yeah. Um, in my specific practice, we do not do in, well, we have five offices. The, one, the little tiny one I've been working in lately, we do not do rapid influenza testing. It's more of a clinical diagnosis. Um, and, but the default position is put them on antivirals. Uh, you know, if you've got somebody who's, and typically there's an exposure history, either in the family or the workplace. Um, and, but as we're seeing right now, this season right now, we've got a lot of severe influenza that's popping up all over the country. And so it's, there's, a, there's a rapid um, assumption that we're going to put these people on antivirals as, a, uh, as, as opposed to anti antibiotics, which wouldn't work. Oh, the solution is get your flu shot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and, well right. yes, I won't say. Other, other comments, questions in the field? Let me ask you um, all one question. It was something that came up in my conversations with Colby in the back. He, he lives up on a farm a little bit north of Frederick, and we were talking about his kids. And he, and he made an interesting comment that, that has been caused an itch in my head, which is he, he says his family is a pretty healthy family, and he thinks it's because of living on a farm, being exposed to so much, that increasingly the more urban we become, the actual, you know, our, our resistance to things is actually uh, uh, the field is narrower. And so... I'm just interested, you know, because we do talk a lot about cities, and we've got a channel at the Atlantic called um, uh, City Lab. Is there a health dimension, a negative health dimension to becoming so, uh, you know, putting ourselves in such a dense urban uh, setting? The cities of the future are actually going to be, you know, make our resistance decline. Kathy? Well, I think I'd defer to the scientists. Uh, on Barry? That. <laughs> There's known uh, the hygiene hypothesis that yeah. basically states that the more you are exposed in an early age, the, the, the earliest... Children born by cesarean section don't have the privilege of getting colonized with normal bacteria through the birth canal. They end up having more medical, metabolic-type issues. And just to uh, make a final point about the dangers of antimicrobials, not just resistance, you screw up your microbiome. The microbiome is really essential in terms of who we are. There are 10 times more bacterial cells in our bodies than human cells and for the most part, these are very good players. They work in a beneficial way with us. We've co-evolved over literally billions of years, or at least thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And uh, uh, there's been epidemiologic demonstration that in the United States, 
Those states that have the highest use of antimicrobials in children have the highest rates of obesity and subsequently diabetes. I think we have to pay a lot of attention to that. We know that kids that are raised around animals, um, you know, these kids often, especially from a young age, often have uh, pretty robust immune systems. And I often tell, we, family medicine, we take care of a lot of newborns and young children, and we typically will say to them, don't be so crazy with that seven second rule where you've dropped the food, and if I pick it up, the, the joke from, my, it's okay, it's been on the floor less than seven seconds, I can feed it them. Uh, you know, wash hands, make sure you teach your kids good hand washing technique, but let's not get too over the edge on this Dirt's one. good for you. Dirt's okay. <laughs> Dirt, dirt's okay. I, I didn't know anything about this, the microbiome uh, stuff, until I read one of my colleagues' articles in The Atlantic uh, that appeared in December called Are Antibiotics Making People Larger by James Hamblin. Uh, don't read this um, either right before or right after lunch. I mean, give yourself some time. It's a, it's, a, it's a bold article for The Atlantic. We have a lot of bold articles, but this is a new bar. But I think it's fascinating uh, to go through the physiolo physiological questions about what antibiotics are yielding in, in, in ways that are very different. George, just leave us with a, a last word of if we were to make you um, all powerful, what, what would you do to move the needle on this issue? Oh, I, I, I would spend a lot of time educating people about the problem. Hmm. Um, I, I think that um, one of our fundamental problems is that we don't spend enough time understanding these issues. And, you know, the, the micro world, uh, we live with the microbes. They're here. There are more of them than us. And um, we're just beginning to scratch the surface about that interaction between people and microbes. Well, I want to thank all of you. Georges Benjamin with the American Public Health Association, Wanda Filer with the American Academy of Family Physicians, uh, Barry Eisenstein, the very cool dude at Merck, and Kathy Talkington of the Pew Charitable Trust. Thank you so much. Really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.